Hi, I'm Andrew Dubber, I'm Director of MTF Labs, and this is the MTF Podcast. So, this is one of those episodes where introducing the guest might end up taking longer than the podcast interview itself, if I'm not careful. Because Dr. Nelly Benhayun Stepanyan does an awful lot of different things that all require some explaining, but could in short be broadly categorized as the creation of experiences. She's a filmmaker, artist, designer, founder and namesake of one of the world's top design studios, founder of an underground university, of an international space orchestra that's worked with Prodigy, the Avalanches, and Sigur Ross. She works with NASA, the European Space Agency, Singularity University, Mattel, Lego, Airbnb, Google, The Guardian, the SETI Institute, the BBC, Red Bull, We Transfer, XL Recordings, MoMA, Victoria and Albert Museum, the National Museum of China. You get the idea. She has, she reckons, 13 jobs, more or less probably more. And at one point was so in demand for public speaking engagements around the world, she employed doppelgangers, lookalikes who she trained to mimic her mannerisms and delivery style so she could literally be in multiple places at once. Dr. Nelly Benhayun Stepanyan, welcome to the MTF Podcast. It's nice to see you again. How are you doing? Yes, it's so nice to see you, Andrew. Hello, listeners. It's great to have you on. You do pretty much everything. And I, I feel like I'm just going to say, tell me about this project. Tell me about that project. Tell me about this project. Because there's so many things that you do that uh, are so much of interest to the people who listen to a podcast like this. So you're, you're more or less an experienced designer, but that doesn't even begin to cover it. How do you describe what you do? Well, actually, you know what? I don't describe myself as an experienced designer, but as a designer of experiences. Okay. Which basically means that suddenly when you start to speak about experiences, then you allow yourself to kind of like look at multiple different fields. Because if you want to make a meaningful experience for a member of the public, then you need to know a bit about music, know a bit about architecture, know a bit about design, know a bit about you know, academia, film, you know, basically all of the different realm of things, right? So if you were to say what I'm doing, I design experiences for members of the public to, you know, experience a rocket lift off in their living room while dark energy is being produced in the kitchen sink, sonic boom are erupting in your bathtub. And then as if it wasn't enough, uh, then you have like a, a volcano that is literally like right there in front of you while someone's is uh, your... I don't know, auntie is expanding stage one, two, and three of the rocket lift off the Soyuz rocket. That's what I do. Okay, so I have to ask the question, why do you do this? Why do I do this? So, you know, I do this because I feel like there is a part of our realities or a part of science as we know it or a part of the mystery of our world that a lot of us don't have access to because we don't have the right degree. You know, if if I'm too small, too fat, if I don't have the right PhD, the chances that you're going to make it to become an astronaut are really small, right? I, I found this so unfair, right? Like, why is it that only like, you know, there is 250 astronauts out there? Why is it that you or I cannot go up there? Why is it that we cannot experience a bit of the magic of going in outer space? you know so in order to give you that kind of magic experience or to give you access to that sublime that is a part of our world then i have to design a meaningful experience i need to actually find a way to give you as close as you can be experienced so i'm not lying to you uh, and i'm giving you that as close as you can be experienced but it's not exactly like being an astronaut but it's like working with an astronaut to actually give you the experience of a rocket lift off in your living room. So that's exactly my process when I work, right, Andrew? So I will develop this uh, pluridisciplinary team that allow me to actually make an experience for a member of the public that is as close as it can be to the reality. And then I started to work in nightclubs very much so because I love nightclub and nightlife um, you know, audiences because they're the most difficult to the most critical, in fact. Mm -hmm. They will criticize everything that doesn't belong in the realm of entertainment and education because they want to be educated as well as they have a good time. Nightclub audiences want to be educated? Is that why they go to nightclubs? Well, I think when you go in a nightclub, you want to, you know, you want to have fun, 
but you also want to learn something, whether it's learning something, uh, you know, on the dance floor with a new move, or whether it is about uh, learning about love and having your first sex experience in the toilet. I don't know what that might be, you know. But what I'm saying is like when you go, you know, the nightlife, exp the nightlife audience is the most difficult to please. Right. Because, you know, there is so much out there, like it's such a a brilliant, um, you know, innovative scene. And I think a lot of people, I mean, I'm sure your listeners might know all of this, but I think a lot of policymakers and, you know, people from politics don't understand that nightlife is really where it's at when it comes to innovation, when it comes to new materials, when it comes to new techniques, sound system, experiential, like every single bit of innovation really happen inside this uh, specific time of the day, you know? Sure. And I guess there's uh, a lot competing for attention uh, when you're in a nightclub, so you have to make an impact. Absolutely, yes. So, And you better not lie to a member of the audience as well during a nightlife experience. So if you tell them they're going to experience something like a rocket liftoff, then you need to bring them the astronauts live you know, as part of the experience. Yeah, and you're not just talking about astronauts, you're, you're bringing in NASA and you're working with actual people who do go into space. That's correct, yes. Uh, I mean, that's coming back to the fact that when I design a meaningful experience, it has to, you know, the meaning come from bringing this pluridisciplinary expert because let's face it, you know, I mean, I am not an astronaut. I don't know what it feels like to be inside the Soyuz rocket, which is a Russian rocket. It's a very specific type of rocket. You know, I don't know the detail of the techniques and so forth. So I need to surround myself with the people that can provide this. Or when I tell you, you're going to make dark energy, which is, you know, 5% of the universe out there. We don't know what sort of energy kind of allow the universe to be in permanent expansion, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this dark energy, if I say to you, you're going to produce it when you're eating your pancakes. So you're going to produce a bit of the unknown while you're making your pancakes, you know, who am I to actually produce dark energy? What does that even mean? You know, I need to bring the best physicist in the world around me to design this thing so that you can then make your pancake face to face with the unknown. And that means, you know, finding myself in places where there is Nobel Prize of Physics or, um, you know, at the Super Kemio Kende in Japan or at the Large Hadron Collider, which is a place where they bombard proton at the speed of light to recreate the first second of the Big Bang. You know, but uh, all of us members of the public, often we don't even know these things exist, you know. We don't even know that there is like, you know, 60 worldwide scientists down below 100 meter underground colliding proton at the speed of light. Like, I mean, think about it, the speed of light, you know, mm. like faster than the speed of light. So it's, a, it's all about giving you that experience. So that was, that's one side of the story, Andrew. Sure. The other side of the story is also for me, there is something extremely frustrating about systems. Um, you know, uh, politics, economic, sociology, everything that comes of, of come within the mainstream or come within the status quo of what you should do or what you should be or what is the right thing to do or not the right thing to do and how politics or top-down approach or hierarchies or, you know, all of these kind of systems for me, they, they are there to be challenged. And so, more and more so, my work is actually about uh, developing collaboration within institutions, uh, whether they are military institutions, whether they are policymaking institutions like the United Nations, NASA, you mentioned, and but many others, you know, and actually find ways and means by which I can design an experience, an event that is going to bring in critical thinking to that specific audience so that they don't produce space the same way, or so that they don't do the work they're doing the same way, or so that they start to think about borders differently, or that we can start developing new visions for what the future of humanity might be. Not everyone can just dial up a Nobel Prize winning physicist or the United Nations or the military or a, a group of astronauts just to invite them onto a project. How did you go about setting up so that you were in such a position to be able to do something like that? I mean, to be really frank with you, I never got myself set up for anything. And I think that's the beauty of it. So, you know, my mom is Armenian. My dad is born in Algeria. Uh, they both coming from a family of immigrants that either survive, you know, kind of like have gone through the ill of colonization or have experienced the Armenian genocide, you know. And so when they arrived with absolutely nothing in France, like they had to be it all from scratch. So I think 
I, the more I think about it, the more I think I get my perseverance because it's what it's about at the end of the day. It's about perseverance, right? I think most of us, our ultimate way of dealing with things is if someone tell us no, or if uh, an institution tell you that you cannot do this thing, then you're going to be like, okay, well, if it's no, it's no, you know, and then you're going to move to the next thing. For me, and for my family in general, it's never been a situation that we could just say, oh, yeah, okay, fine. You know, yes, okay, there is absolutely no Armenians in politics because Armenians are immigrants and, you know, and they don't really belong to politics or they don't have the authority to be in politics. But for my granddad, for example, he wasn't like that. You know, he started in textile like most of the Armenians when they arrived in France. And then he thought, you know what, I'm going to get in politics. And then he became, you know, a uh, mayor adjunct to, you know, and then he started to go in politics and started to actually got the Armenian genocide recognized in France. And, you know, it's like he came out of nowhere land, you know, and I think this is something that I learned from him, but I learned as well from all the family in general, is like you just have to persevere. And I wasn't set up to meet with Nobel Prize of Physics. I'm not set up to meet with any astronaut. But one thing that I think is very um, important to me is that I don't give up. So, you know, it's not about stopping with one astronaut. There is 250 astronauts. So you just have to email 250 astronauts until you have one of them that say yes. It's statistics at the end, it's mathematics. The more you seed all over the world, the more there is chances that you're gonna get an answer. So that I kind of push to the kind of the gimmick aspect or to the, the kind of, I would say the satire aspect to some level because I started to work for many different companies I have more than 13 different jobs, as you mentioned, whether it is working at WeTransfer, WeTransfer sharing files all around the world. I hope all of you listeners are sharing files on WeTransfer. Sure. The best company in the world. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, since 2012, I've been working at WeTransfer. And so I will email, you know, I either email through my WeTransfer email or I email through my United Nations email or I email through my city, such for extraterrestrial like intelligence email or I email through, like I have about, you know, 13 different jobs, 13 different emails. And then I go at it on every single email, every single border. And it's the same with the agency, you know, with NASA. Mm. When I started going there, like I never went to the USA I had no idea, like, you know, it, I, I was like 23, I just graduated, um, you know, my English wasn't even good, but it, it, like between that time and the moment where I turned up and invited at NASA Ames Research Center, I emailed for seven years, consequently, every single person inside this agency, because, you know, it's a public funded agency. So all the emails are online. Mm. So you can go and start finding and understanding the organigram or the politics of that institution online and actually start to email every single person in every single department. So by the time you turn up and invite it and you say, I'm the director of the International Space Orchestra, which is an orchestra I then go to set up, then you know, the doors open because they're like, oh, these are the, this is the crazy French woman <laughs> that's been emailing every single department. Tell me about the Space Orchestra, because that's that's absolutely interesting. So the International Space Orchestra was set up in 2012, and since then it's still going. It's a team of NASA scientists, but also search for extraterrestrial intelligence, uh, institute scientists, basically space scientists, and together they are performing music. But they're not performing just whatever random music. They are either reenacting the drama of being a mission controller at this point in time, or they're reenacting everything to do with failures, everything that go wrong in mission control. They are actually sharing, I would say, the kind of the humanities behind any form of impossible mission, like sending anything in outer space. Uh, and so since 2012, we've been performing with many different artists, whether it is the Prodigies, the Avalanches, uh, Sigoros. Uh, they've been doing, you know, Hollywood Bowl, 17,500 people, sold out show. So they are like, you know, they kind of like NASA scientists become rock star kind of, uh, but they sound pretty bad and I think this is the beauty of it like when you you know we made a, a, a movie about it yeah. about the kind of the entire process of doing it and initially they all sound horrible but I think it's a lot you know after two months of intense training they sound absolutely harmonious and I think it's a statement as to how this agency NASA function right mm. where when someone in a team or in mission control 
doesn't perform well. You don't just let them down there. You are actually all as a group kind of lift that person to actually achieve their, you know, their goal or the mission or, you know, and I think that is very visible from that documentary where we stay, see the full story of the International Space Orchestra. Mm. But I think it's also a statement to them as in how they organize, uh, you know, as an agency and as people in general to actually like support each other in achieving something together. Mm. Uh, and that's that's been, and every single time, you know, for me, every single year, it's, it's uh, we had our five year anniversary, you know, barbecue at NASA with sausages, like performing during the, uh, you know, the total eclipse, you know, but every time I, I watch them and every time there is a performance taking place, whether it is at Savages or when I get them to sing in Russian or in Icelandic, you know, they, they've sing in every single language that is on this planet pretty much. And every time I come up with the most insane challenge just to see if they can do it, you know, mm. and it's always a statement to their endurance, but also to their incredible beings. Uh, that you know they actually always manage it toward the end you know and that's uh, but it never starts mostly and also I'm lucky because I'm working with uh, Evan Price who is a musical director of the International Space Orchestra mm -hmm. and uh, he really is a master of the story you know me I'm the one shouting and kind of getting them in action as you can hear but Evan Price is very much um, the reason why they sound good you know <laughs> So in, in a way, you've uh, turned a bunch of scientists into artists, which sort of leads to another film that you've made, uh, which sort of posits the idea that everyone is an artist. Are you, in fact, a monster? Ooh, I, I don't know if I say that everyone is an artist is I'm not a monster. I mean, I'm not a monster. It's about the origins of knowledge. So it's about trying to understand where knowledge comes from and what does it mean to think at this point in time in history where we had Trump at the time, where we have Putin, where we have many totalitarian regime around the planet and where obviously there is a resurgence for the far right all over the world, right? Sure. With popularism uh, kind of being the norm. So this film is trying to unravel that and trying to understand um, from the perspective of a philosopher called Anna Arendt, who is a political theorist that died in 1975 and survived the Second World War. And she survived, obviously, you know, um, uh, Hitler and she survived Nazism. And so she wrote The Origin of Totalitarianism and she kind of like tried to actually depict what is a totalitarianism regime and uh, what does it mean in terms of like critical thinking and how can you, you know, how as a society we've managed to actually stop member of the public from thinking so they can get indoctrinated into, uh, you know, into someone's ideology. So this film is actually trying to understand at this point in time why we are seeing the resurgence of such doctrines or such ideology. And uh, because I was completely baffled by it, I thought I needed to actually take her writing into action and actually go all around the world to interview every single thinker or makers that I knew and actually ask them, what does it mean to think at this point in time in history? So I'm not saying that everybody is an artist, but what I'm saying is that we are all capable of thinking and uh, what stop us or what could potentially stop us from thinking is systems and the way we have developed systems for ourselves and bureaucracy for ourselves. So basically what I'm saying is we need to actually go and inside these institutions and actually completely reshuffle bureaucracy and the way we develop things. But not only that, you know, the film is also um, saying that there is no such things are, as nation states and everything to do with borders or everything to do with, you know, ideology in general uh, is just going to perpetrate, uh, you know, basically history again and again and again until we break that all together. Fantastic. Tell me about University of the Underground. University of the Underground. Well, look, I mean, I don't know when your podcast is being is going live, but uh, I will say to all of your listeners that uh, we have currently a program that is coming to an end, which is a new politics and Afrofuturism program which was made and led by uh, the political activist and former Lord Mayor, Majid Majid. And Majid has been running this program, which is really calling for black radical imagination in institutions and beyond. 
But uh, having said that, the, the University of the Underground is a charity. Uh, we are free, we are pluralistic, we are transnational, so we exist beyond borders. Uh, and plurality is really one of the core tenets of the University of the Underground in that we believe that uh, we need to start, you know, bringing every single, you know, every single mindset around the table. We need to bring people that we agree with. We need to bring people that we don't agree with. We need to go beyond the kind of this uh, very, uh, you know, kind of uh, bipolar way of thinking that is currently very much the norm in universities and in education and in the public opinion. So we, you know, we're quite controversial for that reason, because, you know, we will invite, for example, the co-founder of the Tea Party, who is obviously a, a very, you know, populist uh, party, and I think it would be fair to say racist party as well. Uh, together with, you know, the leader of Occupy Wall Street and the leader of Black Lives Matter, who will, uh, you know, invite all of these people on the same table to actually speak about their vision as to what is nation states. So that to me is very important to the freedom of thinking and, you know, and we don't really, and so that's, that's kind of like the way that we, we also teach and we, we teach the students how to actually like go into a institution, work within a institution and try to modify them from within through events. So they design events, they learn how to make an experience happen. And then they, they bring that world of the experience, music, film, design, politics, and so forth into the institution to actually challenge them from within. So build their own jobs, doing all of that, write their own you know, storyline as part of this institution and actually pitch themselves in it. It's interesting that you, uh, in trying to give as uh, broad a representation as possible, you give a platform to people that uh, ordinarily wouldn't get a platform in something that is uh, professing to be diverse and inclusive and, and so on. How do you, justify is the wrong word, how do you explain, for instance, bringing on somebody that you, you sort of identify as racist into an environment like that and give them a platform to state views that you might not necessarily agree with? Well, I think you have to remember that when Anna Arendt, who is this political terrorist that, uh, you know, that I mentioned, Anna Arendt, when she wrote the, origin of toti the origins of totalitarianism, she survived Nazism, right? She survived, you know, uh, Hitler and his ideology. But when she wrote the origin of totalitarianism, she went to read Mein Kampf. You know, she had to go and read the thing. You know, and throughout her entire book, she's making reference to, you know, the view from Hitler to actually like build up an argumentation and actually explain why this is mentally, you know, heal and why is there that this kind of led to totalitarianism regimes. So in order to break down systems and in order to bring down, you know, ideology the way that we know them, you actually need to be able to, you know, you need to, to, you know, you need to actually unravel the things that kind of make it happen in the first place. Mm -hmm. I think it's so wrong to just say, oh, that's wrong and actually not look at the reason why it's wrong, you know, and how this got to be there. Because if this got to be there, you know, it's probably because there is a system there that allow for this to happen. So therefore, you know, in order to change it, and in order to actually build change for good and rethink politics the way you know them, then you need to be able to actually unravel what is wrong about totalitarian regimes or racism. You know, you need to understand why systemic racism exists in order to, to, to break it apart. You know, I mean, of course, one view, which is a utopic view, which I wish would be the truth, is to say that racism, racism never exists or never existed. But the reality is right now there is racism, there is systemic racism. And I think in order for us to, to, to fight it and in order for us to make it that it's not part of our future history, then you need to be able to acknowledge it and you need to be able to actually know who are the main leader that actually uh, you know, bring in that sort of ideology to member of the public. And once you have identified that, then you can start going into it, them and their systems and actually break them apart. That's the way we teach at the University of the Underground. That's the way we function. I wouldn't say, I think it's very important as well to me to say that I'm not giving them and I'm not giving racists a platform to speak at all. 
I'm allowing, an, like for me, education is about, and that's where I speak about plurality because plurality is at the core of the thinking in order to not maintain totalitarianism, in order to not maintain, uh, you know, ideology, you need to allow for plurality to take place. Whenever there is one idea that rules it all, so whenever you, Andrew, define the rule or I, Nelly, define the rule on my own, there is a problem. So we should always have places where all of this idea can be discussed, uh, you know, and they can be extremely uncomfortable. And I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying racism is right, obviously. Sure. Uh, but I'm saying we need to actually like find it, you know, and take it apart before there is a replication of what is basically happening and right now in other territories like the moon, for example, you know. Well, I guess these people who are invited know that they're being invited to be taken apart. Well, I mean, if you come to take part into a panel discussion at the University of the Underground, by definition, you already know, you know, given the people that are on the board, that it's going to be a challenging conversation, yes. For sure. And you're probably not going to convince anybody of anything while you're there. Well, I mean, as in like you getting them some new, you know, new followers, for sure not. It makes me wonder what the incentive is to turn up. Like the way we do things is like there is always a panel. So it's not just like them being on their own to talk about. No, no, for sure. For sure. But I, I do wonder why they why they agree to, to come along and join the panel. Well, it's a very good question. I think that's a question to ask them, right? Yeah, I guess. Maybe <laughs> this, uh, there's some sort of psychology in there that uh, I'm not familiar with. But yeah, it's, it's interesting. But the University of the Underground, is it a place? Is it distributed? Uh, how do people go to it? How do they enroll? And what do they get when they've completed? Well, okay, so the University of the Underground is basically based in the basement of nightclubs. So you have, you know, in Amsterdam and in London. So we are based under, um, you know, one of the oldest actually nightclub in Europe called the Marcantine. And then the other nightclub where we are based is called the Village Underground in London. But we are currently online, right? And I think like many universities, we have to make that shift happen because of the current situation, which in a way has been really interesting to us because one of the other tenets of the University of the Underground is, uh, you know, transnational, to be transnational. So to actually think beyond borders. So when you think about knowledge and when you think about knowledge beyond borders, so beyond, you know, kind of the, the system of national states and uh, and the way that they are being, you know, and the way that this political format kind of like rule it all governments and, you know, kind of define uh, the agenda for education and so forth. If you start to develop a platform that is kind of meant to exist beyond that, then actually the internet is a really interesting place to, to be because, you know, but then of course you could argue that the internet is also having their own, you know, borders in the sense that you know, we all know that the internet is far from being a free space. So there is quite a lot to be unpacked there. I don't know if you want me to go in great detail about <laughs> uh, freedom of information, data, and, you know, all of that. But uh, I, I think that's one of many topics that we could spend an awful lot of time on if we... Uh, but if we but you this. see, this is a thing, Andrew, that is fascinating about university in general or knowledge in general. Is like, there is no such thing as um, a simple answer. Mm hmm there is not a yes or no. Uh, there is a plurality of views and there is nuances all over it. So ultimately, yes, we do have zero tolerance against, you know, racism and everything that, you know, is extremely problematic about our societies. But we will invite people that have really controversial views that you could say are, uh, you know, are racist, even though they have not been, you know, taken, you know, to court for their belief systems, uh, obviously. But one thing I'd say to you is like, for me, it is important to, to, to have these conversations. That's what is fascinating about that, about knowledge. Yeah, of course. And there is clearly a uh, political dimension to what you do. Is it to a political objective? Are you trying to achieve something politically with all of these projects that you do? Is it, is it collaboratively to achieve an end? Yes, definitely. I think every single, the University of the Underground is obviously like supporting 
students to define their own political agenda in their work and actually to bring it to life, right? So it's about empowering others and counterculture to actually uh, exist within the realm of uh, the institutions and actually modify them from within, right? And, and we think completely systems. So that's one thing. But then on a personal level, you know, for the past 10 years, I've been working in the space industry. I'm the vice chair of the cultural peaceful use of outer space committee at the International Astronautical Federation. You know, I'm doing a lot of things to do with actually decision making in terms of um, or I'm being involved with a lot of, you know, I would say platform that actually will decide in the next like two, three years what uh, you know the moon might look like in terms of human settlements and and so forth. So, for me, there is definitely a, a political agenda that is the one of you know one that I might not be able to see, but like the next generation will definitely see, which is you know the next generation of human going in outer space and kind of like having this new you know court over there. And it's an opportunity, at least space is an opportunity uh, for me to engage members of the public with the kind of the urgency as well of um, rethinking completely what, what we've, you know, what we could do, but also acknowledging what we have done here on planet Earth. And I think that kind of connection between planet Earth and space is not often made, but ultimately, the people that are currently leading the next endeavor in space uh, are the same people that are currently leading, uh, you know, all across board, whether it's in technology or, uh, you know, in politics, uh, you know, across the planet. And these are, I mean, sorry to like, but uh, white heterosexual men. And for most, I would say like well-educated as well. So there is an opportunity for us to start saying like, okay, well, I mean, I'm not against obviously like white heterosexual men, but what I'm saying is it's a point in time where we realize that there is obviously a lack of diversity or plurality in all of the leadership. So therefore, you know, that is very much clear as well from the, the kind of the visions that are being brought to life as to the future of humanity in space and beyond. And that's the real problem. Because ultimately, we've not even figured out how we have, uh, you know, how to deal with col colonization and how uh, and post colonization is not even something that is being acknowledged uh, and is just decolonization. This sort of decolonization is only starting to to be put into action. And right now, it's mainly a political war that is being used, but it's not actually being used in action. You know, I would say that in a lot of community. And I work from the community, you know, I, I do both work. So I work in communities, but I also work, you know, on decision making and in politics. So ultimately, I have these kind of two hats. And I can tell you that in the community, we are in a really good place where these shifts are starting to take place. But obviously, on the top level, it's still to be seen in terms of like uh, changes and having a different voice, you know. I don't, you know, I'm working really hard on trying to bring, you know, the first drag, drag queen or transgender or, uh, you know, the, the first person that does not fit the norm as per what a space scientist or um, a space decision maker or policy maker look like sure. uh, into the table. Uh, and it's still to be seen, you know, when that's going to happen. Well, speaking of uh, political action, uh, there's none more sort of uh, visible on the world stage as Posse Riot. Uh, everybody knows who that is. Um, but you work closely. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what that uh, what that relationship is? With Nadia of Pussy Riot, yes. I mean, um, look, so Nadia is one of our board members of the University of the Underground. And I met in a conference, actually, and uh, she was in a room surrounded by uh, heterosexual white male politicians that basically uh, were discussing with her about the future of politics in uh, Netherlands. And she was stuck there and they would be they were throwing at her like a lot of statement within you know, and not letting her talk. And this is where we met because I just happened to go and look for a bottle of water backstage in that conference place. And this is where the meetup happened. And I was like, I was dressed up at the time with a big bomber jacket, black bomber jacket. And I think people thought that was the security of Nadia of Pussy Riot. Uh -huh. So that meant that I actually, we, we left that room and I was like, I'm sorry, but you know, and then she came with me basically. And then we, I took her to the University of the Underground. This is where she met the students. 
she started a jam session with the students because the students they also do music and you know a lot of different things and so that's how i would say our friendship started and then through you know through the years that was about three years ago four years ago and then through the years i think you know we've kind of like uh, met in different uh, opportunities and through different projects mm -hmm. uh, and yeah and then everything she does i try to support the best i can i think she's a, a very special and unique human uh, that deserve to be protected, loved, and uh, our work is absolutely most urgent and most important. And I think if any of your listeners are aware, like right now, one of the, as well, one of the, the co-founder of Pussy Riot, Masha, is currently uh, under house arrest in uh, Russia. And so we do a lot, you know, we, we've done some events at the University of the Underground to try and like, you know, share the message about that and also Navalny arrest with Navalny with also uh, one political activist uh, there in Russia, where obviously, you know, the, the regime there is what I would call a totalitarian regime as per the words of Anna Arendt. And so for me, there is, a, you know, there is a, a duty to support people like Nadia and others to actually, because for the work they're doing to fight against totalitarian regime and ideology. Uh, and I think she's doing it in a very unique manner. She's using music. She's using the popular culture to try and share a very complex message. And uh, in a way, she managed to annoy Putin pretty heavily, which is why she actually uh, got put in jail for two years, right? Uh, so, yeah. So I have a lot, a lot of respect for her and for, you know, people like her. You know, Rose McGowan is also someone that I extremely uh, respect and love dearly, who is also on the board of the University of the Underground. And she's one of the person that, you know, was a part of the Me Too movement. She's the person that broke down, you know, Arvind Weinstein, the reason why Hollywood is slowly, slowly changing. Um, you know, many of these people, I think they're just, they're really courageous. I love that you were mistaken for her security, for Nadia's security, um, because I was listening to your Worldwide FM show, and one of the things that you said was that you are a designer of experiences and a boxer, and I can absolutely picture it. And it makes me wonder, what sort of kid were you? <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> were you a scrapper? I mean, I, as a kid, I think I wanted to do every single job. Yeah. You know, like um, sometimes when you're a kid, you say, I want to be a vet. I want to be, you know, whatever. In my case, I wanted to do everything. You know, I wanted to be a librarian, like doing library, you know, the beep beep. When you beep beep, when you go and take the library, I wanted to work in a shopping mall. I wanted to put tiles on the floor. I wanted to paint and be a painter. I wanted, I wanted to do all of these things. And actually, I realized that I, I you know, I realized that I have been true to my younger self mm -hmm. to this point. Because I actually have given her what she wanted to, <laughs> to do. Like, pretty much, it's like if everything was written straight from, like, you know, uh, age three, I knew I wanted to do all of these things, and that happened. But, yeah, boxing is a big part of my life, at least now. And I think, again, because I think it's um, everything about boxing I, first, I find fascinating. Like, the whether it is a choreography on the ring, the dance elements, the... Um, you know, if, if you're talking about sinking in action, I think there's actually a lot of sinking involved with boxing. Some people might not know that, but it is, mm -hmm. you know, you need to kind of make points in order to win. So, you know, use your jab, move around, uh, try and, you know, assess how your opponent is and might uh, be in the ring. I think it's, um, yeah, the, and it's also reconnecting with something that is very, uh, yeah, very human you know, like fighting, as far as I'm aware from day one, you know, we've been fighting for survival for, so it's kind of like allowing me at least to reconnect with that kind of, uh, you know, much more, I would say, animal side of myself. But at the same time, also, I think it's for the work I'm doing too. You have to understand that because of the different jobs like the pressure level i can go through at some point in time can be extremely intense mm. you know yeah i mean maybe 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 we can say entertainment is not but like when you entertain someone or when you do a show with like seventeen thousand people or whatever like you know health and safety like 
contracts, the, the kind of the stakeholders, the financial aspect of that, even when you do a movie, the kind of like the, the real, the number of people, the teams, the responsibility you have, and, and with your students, you know, too, like is sometimes really overwhelming. And boxing has been for me as well, like a, you know, a way to release that pressure too. Mm. Uh, but beyond that, I think it's also like, um, you know, lots is happening in this sport, like beyond that, whether it's also trying to, you know, we did a project with the University of the Underground where the students work with Gleason Gym, which used to be, you know, Muhammad Ali Gym. He's one of the oldest gym of uh, the USA and he's based in New York, Gleason. And we were looking at sports and the ro- how sport can build new politics. So we were actually trying to figure out if there could be a new sport that could be developed within the United Nation to actually get diplomats to start thinking about political border differently. And that to me is really interesting, is when these disciplines like sports and others, music and so on, kind of like leak into other disciplines where you don't expect them to be. Mm. So what if the rules of music start to define the way that politics are taking place, you know, then you start to develop innovative kind of formats and new formats. And that's what I found fascinating and I'm excited about. And speaking of things that you're excited about, um, I was going to say what's next, but we know what's next. Uh, you've got a film coming out. Yes. In 2022. Uh, it's, uh, well, it's called Red Moon, which, you know, is probably going to lift off or be uh, coming to life at the same time as um, the first woman is going to make it uh, to the moon to start the next human settlement, right? The Artemis mission, which is the NASA mission to launch this woman in outer space. So this film, Red Moon, is actually saying, and that's part of also what I was saying to you, like being a part of the Astronautical Federation and realizing that there is a whole side of history that is completely not acknowledged. And I don't know if it's to do with the fact that people ignore it on purpose or whether it is to do with the fact that the people that survived or have experienced colonization or the ill of wars and so forth are just not being represented in this sphere and these places where the future of space is being defined, right? So for this film, Red Moon, what I'm doing is basically I'm reconnecting with some of my uh, family heritage, you know, in Algeria and in Armenia. And I casted two doppelganger family of my family in France. And they really look alike. You know, we all look like each other. So it's quite confusing. It's a documentary, right? So it's not fiction. Like we all look like each other. Obviously, we are not the same people. And we are all tasked with trying to define the next human settlement on the moon. And one of the hypotheses of this documentary, which of course will reveal itself to be true or not, is that people that have experienced colonization or people that have experienced genocide or wars, like in Armenia, will ultimately come up with a different vision as to what the next space uh, or next realm of humanity in space might look like. And so that's what Red Moon is in itself. Like that's basically this experience that these three families are going to go through and we're going through together. And it's also about writing as well at the end of that a paper that we will be presenting to scientists uh, with the hope that, of course, history will not repeat itself. Sure. Because when you hear people talk about going to the moon or going to Mars or whatever, the language of colonisation is a, is a really big part of that. And colonisation doesn't necessarily mean the same thing to everybody who's, uh, who's in the conversation. So I guess that it sort of carries with it effects. If you say we're going to go and colonise Mars, uh, the colonised are going to bring something different to that story. You are absolutely right that I think at this point in time and also for the past few years, uh, colonization has been used again and again and again, specifically in terms of like the next space, uh, you know, plan. And the one thing I'd say to you is that this word is being less and less used because of the connotation, right? And because now the public opinion is saying colonization, don't use that word. Uh, you know, you will be slammed as an institution if you do that. Mm. Uh, but the reality is it's still happening. You know, it's like, even if you don't call it colonization, the visions that are, you know, the vision that are being proposed as being the mainstream as to what we're going to do in outer space are to do with colonization. We, we, you know, even if you don't use that word, you know, the plan is to go on the moon, 
to mine it for its resources, to bring back the resources. And of course, these will be valuable resources because the material that is there, regulated is actually really a rare on planet Earth. So you build this kind of like, it's a like gold pretty much. Sure. So, so it's exactly the same system and the same reasoning behind colonization in the first place, you know, when the colon went and went all over the world, whether it's in India, or whether it's in Africa, like they went to dig, you know, the minerals, take the oil, you know, whether it's in the Middle East and so forth. So there is this kind of idea that this imperialist idea that is uh, there and has never moved or being questioned and discussed and challenged. Uh, and everybody is still very much is at my side. And when you ask any space scientist or anyone in the space industry, what's the next vision in space? Like, who is to you the person that represents the most visionary in this realm of space? People are going to reply Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos, you know, the guy behind Blue Origin and Amazon. And what is their vision exactly? Tell me. Mm. What do they propose that is currently not what we have already done on planet Earth and what we are currently having to deal with right now. Yeah, for sure. So, so what we are trying to do with that film is to try and define new visions. And for me, they come down to actually giving the voice to you know people that have actually experienced the first, the stage one of this imperialist uh, kind of like uh, endeavor that have been set up, um, you know, for the past like hundred years. It's interesting that you've deployed doppelgangers in this because it's you're something last time we spoke, you were telling me about how you've sent doppelgangers to go and give public speeches as you. And for some reason, that doesn't surprise me in any particular way, because you strike me as somebody who needs multiple versions of themselves to go out and, and have these sorts of conversations. How do you go about doing something like that? And what was the thinking behind it? You know, I'm someone that don't believe in nation states. Like, I don't believe that there is um, borders should be defined by politicians or by, um, you know, a piece of paper or, you know, I don't, I don't believe in that. And probably because my family has always been into movement, you know, they've been crossing pretty much always lands before they eventually landed into, you know, France, where they eventually got their papers there. Uh, but I think this kind of idea to be stateless and which is very, you know, core to the philosophy of Anna Arendt as well, to be stateless, to kind of like always be a migrant wherever you go. And this idea that, uh, you know, that to me is the freedom of thinking. And I'm, you know, with the doppelgangers and with this film, my hope is that to some level, because we look alike, the viewer, and that's you know, and I don't know if this is going to work or not, but the viewer might actually get lost into these places and actually not know when I am in Nigeria, not know when we are in uh, Armenia, not know when, and actually have this idea that, you know, perhaps question as well this idea of borders or this idea of connection between people, uh, you know, and that's something I'm investigating in this film. So, so that's why, for me, it was important to have the doppelganger in the film, but then also in general, I find it very, you know, I find this idea that you can be one person and at the same time many others absolutely, you know, fascinating and something that actually excites me a lot about life. Like the idea that maybe there is another person of yourself, like it just makes it way less human centric and egocentric, right? When you start to think that there is no such thing as nation states, then if there is no such things as nation states, if there is no such things as politicians as we know them, if there is no such things as all of that, then what is there? There is territories, there is geographies, there is species, animals, there is sounds that connect different animals together. Uh, like whales communicating between each other. There is uh, with the wind, there is many, there is a sense, there is like a complete new realm of things that is non-human centric. And that is, uh, you know, that to me is where, you know, that's where the future is and where the future has always been in some ways, maybe. Uh, but we've never been smart enough to see it. Well, you strike me as someone who is smart enough to see it, and you strike me as multiple people with multiple, multiple jobs, so you seem to have achieved your objective. Now it's been an absolute blast. I hope we get to do this again soon. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you so much, and thank you to all of your listeners. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Have a lovely day, you all. 
That's Dr. Nelly ben Hayun Stepanyan, and that's the MTF podcast. You can check out all of her many activities at nellyben.com or follow her on Twitter at Nelly ben Hayun. My name's Dubber. You can follow me at Dubber on Twitter, and MTF Labs is at MTF Labs pretty much everywhere. Click whatever button you need to click in order to keep getting these each week and press on the thing that shares it with other people. Thanks very much. Cheers to the team, Jen, Mars and Sergio, uh, to Bamtone and Airtone for the music and Run Dreamer for the MTF audio logo that you're going to hear in just a second. Stay safe. Talk soon. Cheers. Cheers.